good morning. I say good morning. If you're in the back, come on and grab a seat. Walking the pathway is the contemporary service here at Northern Methodist Church. Let's all stand together.
of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Just take a quick second and shake somebody's hand and greet them this morning. We've got some good faces in the crowd. Tarshish, going to Tarshish. 
So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship was threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid. Each cried out to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down to the hold of the ship and laid down and was fast asleep. Then the men were even more afraid and said to Jonah, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them so. This church is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, now we're going to take up the offering, and after that, feel free to stand up and join us in worship.
Please guide our hearts in the way that you see fit, so that we may yet join you in heaven one day. But for now, we are yet on earth. Let us be the best for you that we can possibly be. And in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. The gospel lesson this morning comes from the book of Mark, looking at chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. We hear this story of the calling of Jesus' disciples. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending nets. Immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. And they followed Jesus. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Saints of Orange. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Good to be seen. It is good to be seen. I feel free up here. The podium's not here. Oh, well, I can walk a little bit. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Oh, incidentally, I did the riff this morning on the on the That's that pretty cool. You think the old old square person didn't understand what it was? I, I have how many people talk. I have to say she talks to Angel. Let's bring this on. Yeah. Anyway, let me ask you a question. Have you ever felt uneasy because? Other people are doing some things or having some experiences that you're not. You ever felt that way before? If so, it could be said that you may be suffering from the common cultural tradition known as FOMO. You might know what FOMO is. Fear of missing out. <coughs> This is a description of the feeling that occurs when after we've chosen to be content with our lives, after we've made a decision and are going to stick with it, after we've chosen to sort of settle down, suddenly we're gripped with this sense of anxiety that in so doing, we're going to be missing out on something absolutely tremendous. Come in, exactly. Come in. Very good. I appreciate that. Commenting on this, Jenna Wortham, columnist in the New York Times, said, FOMO makes our lives pale in comparison to all of the fun that we could be and should be having, at least according to everybody else. As a result, we've created a culture that is frantic and exhausted trying to keep up with the ideal life projected upon them by the rest of the world. Simultaneously envious and idolizing those who seem to have it all, while at the same time slowly being filled with a sense of indecision and anxiety, afraid to make any sort of commitment, any sort of decision, because something better might come along. I thought about this FOMO thing as I read our text for this morning. You know, I continue to be totally amazed at the level of faith and courage these four guys had in accepting this invitation from Jesus to follow him. And I have read this, and I've taught it, and I've preached about it from the angle of Jesus, well, Jesus calls everyday people, and he does. But it's really interesting to look at this story from the side of these four unsuspecting guys. Now think about this. They are agreeing to go with this unknown person into 
into an unknown future. Yes, yes, he's beginning to get a reputation. Yes, surely he has a charismatic personality that draws people to him, but he's still unknown, in effect. And he's calling them into an unknown future. And I read that, and I don't know about you guys, I read that and I think myself, why in the world would anybody leave a known quantity to go into an absolutely unknown quantity? Why? Of course, somebody would look at this on the surface and say, maybe these four, Simon, Andrew, James, and John, took a look at the glamorous life they were leading as fishermen, and they had a FOMO moment of their own. And decided we better get while the get was good and have fun, at least for a little while, but look closer. <clears throat> this decision they make is a life-changing decision. It is one with real implications for them and the world around them. And it's a decision that they may waver in from time to time, but it's a decision that they never fully abandon. It's something they decide to do with the rest of their life. And I think that's really sort of the linchpin for these guys and for any and all of us who are bold enough to declare ourselves to be disciples of Jesus. You see, we've got to decide whether or not we're serious about accepting his invitation or we're just big fans of his work. We have to decide whether or not we're willing to love Jesus at least until something better comes along, or are we willing to make this a life-changing decision? In essence, what these four men are facing in our text is a moment where they have to decide between FOMO and follow. And that's a point at which all of us as followers of Jesus have got to reach. We've got to make a decision ourselves between are we going to do this until something better comes along, or are we going to really make a commitment? What is it that we've got to understand before we make that decision? Well, one thing we've got to understand, brothers and sisters, is that Jesus was and is looking for people who are willing to follow him. Notice what we heard Wallace read in our text. Jesus said what? Follow me. He said, follow me. He didn't say, hey, you four guys, yeah, you. You seem pretty cool. Why don't you come and hang out with me for a while, at least until something better comes along? Come on, read my press clippings. Read this book. It's all about me. Come on and be seen with me. See how cool I am and how cool this is. He didn't say any of that, did he? He said, follow me. Do you understand what's going on here? Jesus is talking about here the establishment of a relationship, the sharing of lives. He's talking about the formation of a community. He is talking about doing nothing less than pouring his life into the lives of these four men. And these four men, by hearing this invitation and accepting it, are agreeing to experience transformation as their lives intersect and abide with Jesus' life. The Reverend D.A. Carson tells a great story about leading a Bible study as an undergraduate. In the Bible study, there was a guy named Dave. Dave was a real strong believer, a great witness. <coughs> Reverend Carson said that when there were some times when he came across some difficult people, he loved to take them to Dave and let Dave talk to them. One day a skeptic was introduced to Dave, and the skeptic told Dave about his life. He talked about having a good family, raised up, having a lot of advantages, and his family went to church, but they really didn't believe all that stuff. And he ended up his discussion with Dave, and he asked, so what is it that you have that we don't have? Dave took one look at him and he said this. He said, watch me. Come live with me. I've got a spare cot in my, in my room. I want you to come live with me for a while. I'll share your life with me and I'll share my life with you. I want you to come watch me and see how I live. Let's live together in this experiment for a while. And then at the end of three months, you tell me what's that. But Reverend Carson 
Tarsus said that this guy didn't quite take him up on that offer, but he did spend a lot more time around Dave, sharing his life, watching Dave, learning from Dave, trying to see what the difference was. And at the end of that three-month period, this young man made a commitment to follow Jesus. And later on, he actually became a medical missionary. And Reverend Carson said, as Christians, we are ultimately saying to the people around us, hey, watch me. Share your life with me. And ultimately, you'll see something in need of a Savior that hopefully you'll want for yourself. Watch me. You know, we keep reading survey after survey and article after article to tell us that people don't want to deal with the Christian faith and they don't like church. And we think to ourselves, Lord, what are we going to have to do to open these people's hearts to the good news and to God's people in the church? What are we going to have to do to change their minds? And to that I say, what if we were to be so bold as to actually take Jesus seriously as we see him in this text this morning? What if instead of trying so hard to make our faith trendy and cool, we instead got serious about sharing our life with one another and others? What if we got serious about forming community? What if we got serious about helping one another be formed in the faith? Just like the disciples experienced, and just like every other successful movement of the Holy Spirit in the history of the church. What if we got serious about living life with one another as followers of Jesus? I think we would be stunned at what would happen if we did that. Because we live in a world that wants community. That's the thing we ought to be offered. We've got the best community in the world. Why don't we offer it more? Why don't we want to live in community with them and with us? All of it goes back to that day with Jesus along the shore. This is the deep level of commitment, the deep level of sharing, the deep level of life, the deep level of community to which Jesus called those first followers. And it's the same level to which he's calling you and me. And this is not a level of being afraid of missing out. This is a level of commitment, of deep willingness to follow. We also need to understand this morning that those who follow Jesus are empowered by Him. They're empowered by Him. Kay Heimowitz in a winter 2008 article in the City Journal talked about studies that cited that a growing number of single <coughs> young men are increasingly leading immature, underdeveloped lives. They are choosing to hang out in a playground of aimless and irresponsible behavior. And many of them fail to reach their full potential. Heimowitz went on to write, when these young men are not challenged to make some deep contact in their lives, then they just swim across the surface of life. Young men especially need a culture around them to help them to identify worthy endeavors. Adults are not emerging. They are made. They don't emerge. They're made. And that's not true just for young men in our culture. That's true for a lot of people in the FOMO-esque world in which we live. And that's what makes the second part of this, this promise, this invitation from Jesus, such a powerful and a special thing. As wonderful and as fantastic as it is to hear Jesus say, hey, y'all come with me, follow me. This is an invitation with an intention. These four are being invited to follow Jesus in order to live in grace with one another, in order to be formed and learned together in community and in order to go out and lead in service and in witness. He says to them, come follow me and what? I will make you fishers of men and women. Amen. Grace, community, transformation, wonderful things. But this second aspect, 
To follow after Jesus and only be fishers of men and women, it provides something that's at the longing and the deepest level of every human being, whether we want to admit it or not. And that is a longing for a true purpose in our lives and the grace to fulfill it. And when Jesus comes along and says to these guys, follow me, he's inviting them into that kind of relationship. He's inviting them into a relationship where they will be made as his followers. And in turn, they will find that calling to go out and share the good news, and they'll have the grace and the power to do it. And that same longing is true for us. We have that longing. We want to know our lives count for something too, don't we? Don't you want your life to count for something? We want to know that. And that same invitation, that same opportunity, that same empowerment, it's there for us this morning as well. Not through a fear of missing out. It's there for those of us who are willing to sign on the dotted line and say, yes, Lord, I'm with you to the end. You see, brothers and sisters, ultimately, we have to choose between <coughs> FOMO ship and follow ship. And we come back to that question I asked at the beginning of the sermon. What in the world would prompt these four responsible guys to drop everything? And notice James and John leave Daddy in the boat. They're serious. What would prompt them to leave all of this to go to an unknown future? What in the world would prompt them to do this? And more importantly, what kept them from falling into the trap of the fear of missing out and dropping away from all of this when a safer, better, more acceptable offer came along? <coughs> well, what was the difference? The determining factor for the disciples and for us is the knowledge that ultimately we've got to decide what is the true source of our calling, the true source of our power, the true source of our life. The true source of who leads us. And for the disciples, that answer was to be found in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Under which they agreed to live as soon as they accepted his offer to follow him. I don't think it's any coincidence whatsoever that we see this play out, for example, in the 6th chapter of John's Gospel. I love the 6th chapter of John's Gospel. It begins with a buffet story. <laughs> Jesus feeds the 5,000. And it's great. And this huge crowd eat, and they have a great time, and they're having, you know, watching the show, and they've got food, and it's wonderful, and they keep following Jesus, and they want more of this. But then Jesus turns and tells them what it means to follow Him. Not till something better comes along, but what it really means to follow Him. And when He tells them that, they all scatter in a FOMO frenzy. And then he turns to the disciples and he says, Hey, you guys want to get out of here too? And it's Simon Peter, that same Simon who's by the shore in our text, that turns to Jesus and says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You've got the words of eternal life. That's what it means to follow. It means to realize there is no new frontier. We make it here. This is what made the difference for them. This is what led them into followership. What is it that prompts our decision this morning? The Reverend Tim Keller once wrote, I've heard people say from time to time, I'd like to give this Christianity thing a try, but... I understand that you Christians can't do this, or the Bible tells you you have to do that. That's just something I can't agree to. Keller went on to say, well, the ultimate question is this. If Christ truly is God, why do you have any conditions? Amen. There are no conditions if Christ truly is God. To know Jesus as Lord is to say, yes, Lord, I'm ready to obey you. No strings attached. If he really is the Son of God, you can't have him as a supplement. You see, that's the difference between FOMO ship and follow ship. That was the difference for the disciples, and it's got to be the difference for us. 
William Alexander, in his epic work, The $64 Tomato, said this. He said, if you were doomed to live for all eternity the same life that you're living now, over and over again, would you be happy with your life? And if the answer to that question is no, then why are you living the life you're living? Stop making excuses and do something about it. I can't help but think that something of a similar nature must have been going through the minds of the disciples that day along the shore. I don't think they were really happy with the life they were leading. They wanted to do something about it. They were willing to follow Jesus. That's the same decision we've got to reach today. I mean, let's think about it. Is it really a fulfilling life to live constantly afraid of making any level of commitment because something better might come along? Is that abundant life? Or should we instead choose to make a stand? To follow Jesus. To accept His invitation to live in grace. To learn together in community with other believers. And then go out and lead a mission and His service to the world. That's life. Is it fellowship? Or fellowship? What choice do we make? Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks and praise this day for the gift of your calling. Forgive us for those moments when we have seen it as a burden, seen it as a, a, a filler, a space gap, if you will, something we can do to something better comes along. Lord, give us eyes to see and a heart to know that this is an offer for abundant and eternal life that we dare not turn down. There is no better offer coming. This is an offer of life. Give us grace to follow the example of those, of those first four men that you called who went into an unknown future, but they did so because they knew they were going with the one who held them. Give us the strength of faith to do the same thing. Help us, Lord, not to be those who fear missing out. Help us to be the followers you call us to be. We pray this in your name and for your sake. Amen. Let's all stand together. Thank you. 
prison. You have risen with all power in your hands. You have given me a second chance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. 
followers of Jesus Christ. Jan Holland, I want to thank you for doing whatever that dance was that you did a second ago. I can see all of you very clearly from where I am. So some of you are clapping, some of you are kind of standing there like this, and Jan Holland just kind of did this. <laughs> Seizure or what, but it looked good. <laughs> Thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. I love it.